you, a faculty member at an American public university paid for by taxpayer dollars, are conflating speech with violence? Yes. There was a very interesting exchange that happened a couple weeks ago between The Daily Wire's Michael Knowles and one of the faculty at Cal State LA on the concept of violent speech. For those who don't know, The Daily Wire is a conservative news outlet, and the title of Knowles' speech that evening was Immigration and the Wall, during which he made a case for building a border wall. Now, the touch point of their exchange was a protester sign that said, quote, anti-immigrant rhetoric is violent free speech. So we're going to let the clip roll for a minute and then reconvene with an argument. I'm, I'm faculty here. I also support our support our, um, protester in the back. What do you support specifically? Do you, do you think that anti-immigrant rhetoric is violent free speech? Yes, because of the you, reasons you think that, that speech is violence. Uh, no, I think that that's the, what that sign says. The conversation that you're having is oppressive. It, um, and so I am oppressing people by what I'm doing. So I am I am exerting violence on people by my speech. That's what the sign says, and that's what you just said. It contributes to And the protester is saying that's exactly what I'm doing, and she's saying that's exactly what her sign means. So that means that you, a faculty member at an American public university, paid for by taxpayer dollars, are conflating speech with violence. Yes. Okay, so according to her, a conversation about illegal immigration is oppressive towards persons of color by virtue of it contributing to systems of racism in America, and therefore, is violence. Now, there's a lot loaded in that, but let's look at the broader proposition upon which this kind of thinking is often based. Speech is violent when it contributes to an atmosphere of danger or harm. Now, this woman's understanding of violent speech seems to be whatever contributes to oppression. But this is unnecessarily restrictive, so we're going to opt instead for this phrase, atmosphere of danger or harm, which is a modification of a phrase sometimes used in discussions surrounding free speech and hate speech, and one that includes, but is not limited to, virtually all types of oppression. Now, for the sake of argument, let's accept this premise as true, and then see where it takes us. Premise 1. Speech is violent when it contributes to an atmosphere of danger or harm. Premise 2. Speech contributes to an atmosphere of danger or harm when it can be or is used to justify or promote harmful attitudes or behaviors against other people. Just like harm and danger is a range, can be and is is also a range. The former of which being the more broad and extreme form, but both nonetheless touted by some activists and educators. Premise 3. Speech that suggests the content of premise 1 can be and is used to justify and promote harmful attitudes and behaviors against other people. In support of this premise, equating what is at most harmful speech with violence contributes to the commission of actual violence, that is, the use of physical force to inflict harm, as a response to perceived harmful speech. Knowles himself gives an example of this in a clip we'll see in a moment. Premise 4. So, speech that suggests the content of premise 1 contributes to an atmosphere of danger and harm. This follows from premises 2 and 3. Premise 5. So, speech that suggests the content of premise 1 is itself violent speech. This follows from premises 1 and 4. So if this argument is sound, what it reveals is that the concept of violent speech itself applies to its very own verbalization. Now this argument is logically valid, that is, the conclusions follow necessarily from the premises, but if you think that it is unsound, that is, that premise 2 or premise 3 are false, since premise 1 was granted for the sake of argument and 4 and 5 are concluding premises, then please correct me in the comment section below. All right, now let's continue with our exchange, then pause with some commentary and an analogy that draws on the abortion debate. Um, speech can be violent. What you are saying contributes to systemic racism in this country. It means that my students of color are pulled over and accused of stealing a car when they did not. I'm not pulling anybody over for stealing I'm any not cars. I, that you I see many did. people of many different races in this room. I, I, they all seem to be doing just fine. I don't think I, any, any of them have felt violence because they listened to a lecture on on basic facts about our immigration system. The question was, have I asked people in this room if they've felt as though some violence has been committed on them? Uh, no, I haven't asked because no violence has been committed on you. Because violence is not a subjective feeling. Violence is an objective fact. I can objectively gauge whether or not someone has become violent. The other day, I was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Some protester attacked me with some weird chemical. That was an objective act of violence. But somebody disagreeing with me, such as some people in this room are doing, are not committing violence on me. Oh, Reginald, I disagree. This is a very good point here about disagreeing speech that also applies to offensive speech. 
Now, of course, no one flatly says that speech that is in conflict with their political, philosophical, or religious beliefs is the standard by which they delineate violent speech, hate speech, or offensive speech. But in practice, this is actually how many activists, students, professors, and tech companies appear to operate. Nolce's point here illuminates that if disagreeing speech or offensive speech is the standard by which we determine what constitutes hate speech or violent speech, then no one is innocent. Think about this. To someone that's pro-life, it's a baby in the womb. To someone that's pro-choice, it's merely a fetus or a conglomeration of cells. To those whom are pro-life, pro-choice rhetoric is dehumanizing and contributes to an atmosphere of lethal danger towards unborn babies. Now, of course, if you're pro-choice, you probably reject this paradigm altogether, right? I don't imagine that many people firmly on the left are still watching at this point. But for those of you that are, imagine if you got banned from YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or any other platform for referring to a baby as a fetus or an impersonal conglomeration of cells on grounds of hate speech. Would you regard that as fair, impartial, and objective? Furthermore, Imagine if pro-life activists, students, and professors were equating your speech to violence against the unborn and were using this line of reasoning to justify violence against you, unprovoked. Would you regard this as just? Or would you consider this extraordinarily dangerous? Danger, danger, danger. Unbelievable. Now these are very serious issues, so we need to be very careful and thoughtful in all of this. And I say this with all respect and with great distress for our universities. If our teachers don't under understand the difference between ideas and violence, between speech and violence, then they are in no position to educate the next generation of Americans.